HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Cabot Creamery, celebrating 100 years of being a dairy farm family-owned cooperative. Learn more at cabotcheese.coop. That's cabotcheese.coop. This week on a special bonus episode of Meat in 3, we find out why the bacon, egg, and cheese, that classic bodega sandwich, is popping up on menus of New York's trendiest restaurants. We did a few iterations of it, and I was trying to fancify it. We tried the sausage, egg, and cheese, and then we tried to put charmoula sauce on it. We used feta cheese, and we're just like taking ingredients of the Mediterranean, if you will, and try to infuse it. But uh, for me, it was like a car wreck. Tune in to hear about the wild journey of the bacon, egg, and cheese, from deli to fine dining, on Meat and 3, HRN's weekly food news roundup, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. Before we get into the episode, I want to just give a quick shout out to our 10th anniversary gala, which is happening pretty soon on November 11th. You can find tickets and all the information by going to heritageradionetwork.org. There is a little icon in the bottom left. It should say Heritage Radio Network's 10th anniversary gala. It's going to be at the Palm House and Yellow Magnolia Cafe at Brooklyn Botanical Garden on Monday, November. 11th from 6 to 10 p.m. And tickets are going fast. So go online, check it out, and please join us to help celebrate 10 years of Heritage Radio Network. For those of you out there who think that you can't become a renowned chef by responding to an ad to be a waitress, Whitney Otaka is here to prove you wrong. While taking French classes at the University of California, Berkeley, she responded to an ad for a waitress position at a local French creperie. And she didn't get the waitress job, but she was hired into the kitchen there, and her culinary career began. She was raised in the Mojave Desert in Hesperia, California, about 30 minutes from Joshua Tree. Her family struggled a bit financially, and life was not always easy, and food was not always super accessible. In her winding career, she's worked on both coasts from Northern California to Southern Georgia, and she's worked for incredible chefs such as Hugh Atkinson and Lytton Hopkins, and she staged staged at Per Se and Le Bernardin. She appeared as on season nine of Top Chef, and she just released a cookbook, The Saltwater Table, Recipes from the Coastal South. Chef Whitney, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So... As we do on the show, we usually start at the beginning. We try to cha- trace the sort of origin stories of how everything began. But I want to hear about this first job because you went in looking for a waitress position. You were in college at UC Berkeley. And it feels a little bit weird that you went in to be a waitress and they said, would you want to cook? You can't, you're not qualified to be a waitress, but do you want to jump on the line and, and, uh, start, you know, killing yourself while you're still in college? So how did all that come about to be? And why did you even accept the job? Well, the question is, what does that say about the restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think as, uh, many young women growing up, I had this deep fascination with French culture. I'm not exactly sure where it stems from, but it was pretty early on in my childhood that I had, you know, sort of this love of everything French. So when I went to Berkeley, 
um, I was taking French classes and I saw this ad. It was actually just about five blocks from my house in downtown Oakland, which was perfect, right? Because I didn't have a car. And I went in there. I pretended to have waitressing experience. I thought, you know, oh, I'm going to be like Amelie. I'm going to be in this cute little French cafe waiting tables. This is perfect. (laughs) But the owner, Eric Leroy, I think he could see right through me and the fact that I didn't have waitressing experience. But for some reason, took a liking to me and decided instead to offer me a position in the kitchen, um, which really was so formative for me as a chef. It was this tidy little, you know, kitchen manned only by Eric, the owner. He worked seven days a week, which should have been a sign for me in the future of what being a chef is. He um, would sit down every night with me and have dinner. We'd always have dinner. He made traditional um, Breton style galettes and crepes for dessert. We had French cider, um, ratatouille, uh, tomato coulis. Everything was made from scratch and the best ingredients. He got in the buckwheat flour from Canada because he didn't like the availability of what was in the United States. I did everything from wash the dishes to prep the food early to anticipate his every move, you know, warming the coulis or the ratatouille to, to each order. I made cappuccinos. I made coffee. I bus tables. I, I kind of got like the 101 of restaurants. The perfect crash course too. Yeah. Oh, you're going to have to do a little bit of everything and <laughs> it's going to be much harder than you think. And uh, you're going to work a lot longer than you think. Uh, let's rewind to early childhood though. Were there inklings, dreams, thoughts about getting into food? You obviously got into UC Berkeley and you were studying, uh, you were studying there. So I'm assuming you did quite well in school. Was there were there thoughts of what you would be when you grow up, when you were young, and, and how did that get maybe derailed or, or realized by becoming a chef? Yeah, um, so there's a lot of angles to that there. As far as like my food um, preferences, any inklings of being a chef, no, it didn't exist. I always say that I didn't know what a chef was growing up in Hesperia, California. There wasn't any, you know, Michelin starred restaurants. We did get to go down to LA to the museums and things like that, but we definitely weren't eating at, you know, amazing restaurants. Um, So that was, you know, not a part of my vernacular. But I wanted to be an archaeologist, and I say that stems from watching a lot of Indiana Jones movies, but I wanted to be an Egyptologist more specifically, and I really remember knowing that I wanted to do that in the fourth grade. Like, it was really early on. I was telling everyone I was going to be an archaeologist. Um, so so that's how I ended up, you know, going to Berkeley. I was always into studying, into, you know, learning. It's, I mean, a great chef is always into learning, really. I think that's a part of what, what makes uh, great chefs great is their interest in continuing education. Definitely. So you're a young female Indiana Jones running around the desert <laughs> and uh, – you know, I want to I want to know about first kind of interactions with food, and did you have a big palate when you were growing up? Were you uh, were you experimental in the kitchen? Were you a craft mac and cheese kid? Like, what did you get into? And uh, while you were out digging for dinosaur bones, what were you eating? Dinosaurs paleontology. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, okay, so I was a very picky eater, and I say that is because I was had such a good palate. <laughs> um, you know, and I made very interesting food decisions as well. I decided to become a vegetarian at the age of, I think I was 12 years old, and no one around me was a vegetarian. I was the weird kid who wouldn't eat the enchilada in the school lunch. You know, it was just, I made these very particular food decisions. Um, You know, we didn't have a lot of um, money in my family, but my father did have very interesting taste. He liked flavors. He's Eastern European, so he liked flavors like licorice and coffee, and he liked Roquefort blue cheese. And then my mother was, you know, a good home cook. So these were, were all sort of ingrained in me, even though I wasn't having access to all these, you know, great foods. I did love some of the traditional Eastern European dishes um, that I was exposed to. I loved... Um, 
cabbage rolls is probably still my favorite um, dish, you know. Like um, a beef stuffed cabbage? Is yeah, that what it's that is? beef and rice uh, rolled in a cabbage leaf. And you can either bake or braise, but we braise ours with tomato and beer and carrots and potatoes. And it's simple and Hungarian? beautiful. Is that it, kind it, of? If or? you look at it, for my family, we're Slovakian okay. and um, Hungarian, but also you find it a lot in Polish cooking. So it's all sort of throughout that region. My family's from Hungary, and that sounds like something that... Not that my grandparents ever made, but that I have seen uh, and heard was part of their sort of grand their grandparents' repertoire back High in, five in the day. In yeah. the house. <laughs> way way back in the day, uh, and so. You're you're studious. You're you're very into school. What other things like when you're a teenager and you're kind of making those initial decisions about who you're going to be as an adult? You know, you're like 15 and you think you know what you're about, but you don't. Or maybe you're you're making those decisions about uh, being an individual and going to school. Uh, how did that next step in your life come to be? Oh, as far as like. Going to Berkeley or? Yeah, like making those decisions, like staying on the West Coast and going to UC Berkeley and moving up to Oakland. Like, were you always just going to stay in California or? You know, I I wanted, I didn't have access to travel as a a young child. I knew I wanted to. I wanted to go places. I always sort of envisioned traveling. Um, As far as my educational path, it was all about the best education I could get my hands on. And I applied to, you know, I originally actually wanted to go to uh, Boston University. I wanted to do there. They have, you know, their archaeology program, and I wanted to go to Brown to do Egyptology because there's that's a specialized field. Um, but Berkeley came along. I did get into Boston University, and I did get into Berkeley, and I was sort of like, what is actually the best decision here for me as far as, like, what do I think is going to be the best move for my education? And Berkeley's so renowned. It was just – it had to happen. But I was 17. I moved to the Bay Area, and I would lived in this really isolated environment, so I didn't know <laughs> what to do with myself. <laughs> it was just like – I mean, I'm not, like, from some podunk town, but I didn't know – how to move around a city, you know? And I was 17 by myself, just sort of like figuring like it out. Like you got to the Bay and it was emotionally taxing kind of to be in such a big place or like, were you, did you feel overwhelmed? What? No, it wasn't that, you know, I don't necessarily get emotionally overwhelmed by things. It's always a challenge, but I was just sort of like, well, Oakland still had this reputation, you know, of Oakland. It was not what Oakland is now that everybody knows. Mm-hmm. So I was like, what, where do I go? How do I get around, right? I don't have a car. Well, what's this BART? I mean, I, it sounds crazy. It does sound like I grew up in like a 10-person town. But. No, I, I, I totally hear you. I grew up in, in the suburbs, and when I moved to a big city, it was the same way. Yeah. I think it's just it, there's a certain amount of culture shock by going to any big city, even if yeah. you lived in the suburbs right outside of that big city. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just it's a total, it's a chill, total change of pace. And so you're in school. And things shift maybe a little bit when you get this first job and you really get thrown into the fire, which is usually this happens to people on like their third or fourth job. They're like, I wash dishes here. And then I worked at a crappy Italian restaurant. And then you get the hardcore chef owner hybrid who makes you do everything. It sounds like you had a great relationship and you were beginning to kind of develop your first mentor. Did he push you to continue your career or did you know that this was now something that was speaking to you? Well, so, you know, the Bay Area is um, an amazing sort of pot, right, of food. It's like all of a sudden I'm in this food environment. So, yes, the restaurant is shaping me, but so is my environment, very much so. I had an apartment across from Berkeley Bowl. I don't know if you know that grocery store, but it's kind of famous. It's famous across the country, really, but especially in Berkeley. Half the grocery store is produce. So it's like I went from these desert grocery stores, you know, where it's like the produce looks very sad (laughs) to all of a sudden being like uh, bulk grain bins. And and, I mean, this was in like the early 2000s. And it's just like every produce item you could ever imagine is in Berkeley Bowl. And this was my everyday grocery store. That's one education. You know, uh, also the world is at your fingertips. It's like everything is delicious and available in the Bay Area. Berkeley walking around, it's just like, oh, Ethiopian cuisine. What is this about? Let me taste this. Let's try this. 
you know, you go to the Mission District of San Francisco and it's like the most beautiful um, El Salvadorian food and Mexican food that you can get your hands on. It's just all of a sudden everything was around me and I was being exposed to it the first time I ate Japanese food, you know, it's like in Oakland. It's just like all of a sudden these doors were just opening. And on top of that, I'm in this restaurant with this chef owner, he wouldn't have called himself a chef, who makes everything from scratch and who sits at night and talks with me about food. It's just like, it was everything I was absorbing. All of a sudden, the education at Berkeley was secondary to learning about food. So then where did you end up going next? Sure. Yeah. So I I graduated from Berkeley and thought, well, here we go. I should, you know, I, I wanted to take a year off. I was, I was, I'd lost my track a bit because I was so in love with food. Well, maybe I didn't lose my track because it worked out, but I, I'm in this like position of like, okay, I should use my degree. And so I actually moved to San Diego for a brief period and I was working, um, in historic preservation for the city of San Diego just to get a year of work under my belt. And I get through the work really fast and I ask, you know, what more to do in the course of a day. And they told me once, this is why the city of San Diego was once in debt. I hope they don't rebel against me to work slower. So I was bored and I missed restaurants. So I found a um, job. It was actually waitressing um, at a little place called, it's called Just Fabulous. And the, the pastry chef was Burl Ann Bird. And she made the most extraordinary pastries. Pastries are very popular in San Diego. They have a sweet tooth there. And so we had these cases of cakes and pies and every cookie and like every beautiful thing. And the shelf life of anything was never more than two and a half days. If If it was over two and a half days old, we would be allowed to take it home and eat it. (laughs) So I was eating all these pastries, but all of a sudden I was working with people that had gone to CIA and they were pastry chefs and it was usually women. So it was great and easy communication for me. And I began to get curious about what their path was. I suddenly began to think about the idea that I could cook professionally. So that was sort of the the transition there. And did you end up baking there or did you move on to another place? Did you go to culinary school? You're, you're, you're being surrounded by all these people that have made their decision that this is going to be their professional career. What's the next stage for you to maybe make the transition from desk to prep table? Yeah. So the, the, the real catalyst for me was a move to the South. So we were living in San Diego. We was my ex-boyfriend and I at the time, and he had lived in Athens, Georgia. And he had kind of hopped back between, you know, Georgia and California and was like, let's move to Georgia. And I was like, great, an adventure. Sounds wonderful. You know, I'm not loving my desk job <laughs> and I'm definitely not wanting to be a waitress. So let's go. So when we moved to Georgia, it was sort of this great moment of learning for me where all of a sudden I was immersed in a totally different culinary culture and I just fell head over heels in love with it. You know, again, it was back to what is this food about? Where should I eat? Where should I try to eat? Where should I go? There was all these moments that began to point to the fact that I wanted to be a chef. I got a quick waitressing job. I started realizing I would watch these guys on the line And I used to think I could do this better than they can, which is funny because I've never cooked professionally, really, you know. Um, But I just knew I could. I just knew I could be better at it. So I did go to culinary school. I was like 26, right? And I'd worked in restaurants, but never really sort of honed the skills, the basic. And for me, education is the platform, right? It's like the foundation. So if I can move ahead quickly... um, that was that was the idea is like get these skills under my belt, which, you know, culinary school is not something I'd always recommend to everybody, but I did it. <laughs> did you go in Georgia to culinary school? I did, school? yeah. I made that decision based on the fact that I was falling in love with Southern cuisine. And so I wanted to stay in my region. And so I went to Le Cordon Bleu there. And so did you end up at five and 10 straight out of culinary school? No. So the, the day I decided that I was going to do this, I... When I basically started school and started working at 5 and 10 within a week of each other. So I would work all day at 5 and 10 in Athens, and then I'd do an hour and a half commute to Atlanta and go to school at night. And I did that five days a week. And then I worked on the weekends too. So it was, it was pretty much like full submersive 
culinary life. <laughs> so clearly when you, when you want something, you go for it. Yeah. <laughs> you definitely seize it. You had spent almost all of your life done very little traveling on the West coast. You'd, you'd been Northern Southern California, and then you make a big jump to Georgia. Was there any hesitation? Did you have any fears or do you just go for things and then figure it out along the way? You know, I, I do have fears. I, I wouldn't say that I always just jump. I mean, I'd probably own three restaurants by now if I didn't have any fears, <laughs> but, um, but as far as like, there's something about food where I'm, you know, like in traveling and moving, it's like I, any opportunity I have to move into a different culture to learn something, it's a different, uh, it's a different want and desire. It's not as fearful when, you know, you're, you're going for a learning purpose. So, um, so no. <laughs> when you moved to Athens in 2005, I mean, Athens is a, is a cool city. I think some people just know it as REM is from there. Right. I think it, it, has a maybe an outside perception as being like a sort of like a hip college town, right? Like maybe it's the the Austin of Georgia, yeah, if that's yeah. sort of a unfair assessment. Maybe sorry, but um, very different than Atlanta, right? And you were going back and forth and back and back and forth. Was the style of the cities was one rising to the top as being more interesting to you, or did you did you stay in Athens because that's where you and your boyfriend at the time were, or did you like Athens more than Atlanta? Well, I think so. At the time, I think Atlanta's culinary scene was rising. Annie Catrano, right? She has been sort of I call her the the greatest chef um, of Atlanta, and she kind of like really rules the city. She was already established and had Bacchanalia and Star Provisions and her amazing restaurants. Linton Hopkins at the time was sort of um, becoming a more um, prominent figure in the culinary scene. And there there was just sort of these like undercurrents of chefs sort of like rising up. And Athens had Hugh Atchison. And for me, I was placing myself in a kitchen where I could learn the most that I could. So in five and 10, I was working up the line, right? So I was establishing who I was there. I started as a prep cook. My goal was to get over to the hotline because the the first thing I wanted to learn in the course of cooking was how to work the line. I mean, if you don't know how to work the line, you're screwed. <laughs> and so I actually, with culinary school, I was at this point of making a decision. I almost went to work for Annie Catrano, who I absolutely admire so very deeply and work with um, on different events now currently. But you know, I had this opportunity to go work for her, but I knew that I was, I was again, climbing that ladder within the context of one restaurant I was at. So I decided to stay because Hugh, because of the team, because of where I was. So. And you, you worked for Hugh for a long time and you rose up the ranks there. Uh, I think, you know, most people that don't live in the South, their interaction with him is on TV. And so he comes off as being quite genuine as a celebrity chef and a very patient, even keeled guy. I'm curious, is it the same in the kitchen? And is it uh, the type of experience that you had there where you uh, were constantly under an immense amount of pressure or was it a sort of a more patient Southern laid back kind of vibe. Uh, I, Definitely not. Okay. Well, Hugh's Canadian. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have the laid back vibe. He's a very smart um, individual. He's mm -hmm. very intellectual. I mean, he's not always my favorite person in my, in my stories are, 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 um, uh, we have a break we'll say later on in life, but at the time five and 10 had an incredible team. So I think one thing that you can tell when you walk into a restaurant kitchen is how the team functions and you can feel it right away. Either the team is together and they're making it happen through stress, pressure, intense, you know, working conditions, or you have a fractionalized team where people turn on each other and it's not a great work environment. Um, five and Ten's team was incredible. There was a prep chef named Homero who taught me so much early on. Um, my future husband was working in pastry there. You know, the cooks would teach each other. It was incredibly intense. You know, it was a 100-seat restaurant. We would do, on our busiest nights, you know, 325, 350. It was a lot of pressure. There was never recipes given to us you would be told what your menu was for the night and you were expected to create it. 
I mean, I think that's wild as a chef now. That's I'm like, wild. Who would trust? <laughs> I, I've had a cook for five years, and I'm like, did you follow my recipe? Um, so they would say, tonight you're making cornbread, yeah. so make it and I'll taste it before service there and make was sure it's some, good. <laughs> there were some recipes. Homero was like the oracle, right? So uh-huh. it would be like, Homero, what is this? Or... You, I would go to Hugh sometimes and be like, how do you see this? And he would just be like, rattle off ingredients. Or uh, Chuck Ramsey, the chef de cuisine, was also very helpful. You know, you'd go to him and he'd tell you. And you have to remember or write it down really quickly. Nobody was keeping notebooks back then. Every every cook now, I'm like, where's your notebook? Why aren't you writing down what I'm saying? But like back then, it was just like memory. And um, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was intense and crazy, but... Um, it was, I mean, I learned so much and also, I mean, I was working there, but I also worked at restaurant Eugene for Lyndon Hopkins. So as soon as culinary school was done, I took on a second job for Lyndon Hopkins. So I would do four days a week at five and 10, and then I would commute and do three days a week in Atlanta with Lyndon Hopkins. You beat me to my next question, which is that I Google mapped from one restaurant to the other and it's an hour and 15 minute drive, Mm -hmm. 67 miles from one restaurant to the other. Most line cooks can barely get on the C train and make it to their job and work the six or five shifts a week that they do. You were going... Whatever the whatever the next step of full throttle is, like you were three <laughs> past that. Um, were you afraid of burnout? Did the chefs find out that you were working at both places? Like, were you trying? Were you trying to do it to challenge yourself as much as you could, or was it a necessity of maybe? Did you feel behind because you had done other things? I'm just curious. Why did you go? so aggressively in that way. Sure. It was all learning. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a feeling of behind, but I think as every cook knows, there's something to be said about learning in different kitchen environments. And every kitchen is an opportunity to sort of distill what will become your style. And 5 and 10 was the kitchen to work at in Athens, Georgia. There wasn't anywhere else to work. And I loved where I was in that place, and I loved the team. I loved the energy there, but I needed to be learning something more as well. And so working for Linton Hopkins, I mean, 5 and 10, we definitely worked with different farmers. We got we worked with Woodland Gardens, which I still think is one of the great one of the great farms um, in this country for produce. Actually, one of the the main farmers there, Tucker, he went on to run the farm at the French Laundry to give you an idea of the quality of what we were working with. Um, And Celia Barris is just fabulous. But at Restaurant Eugene, it was... I think there was an even more of an emphasis on locality. And so there was different products coming in. There was a different style of line. Um, uh, Ryan Smith, who is the chef of Staple House, very well allotted... Um, James Beard nominee. He was the chef de cuisine at a time. You know, you develop different relationships with people and you begin to learn from them. He was really into charcuterie. So it's just like I was absorbing all this different information. And I I love to work. I love working. (laughs) We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about more. You really digging in, working even harder and moving on to your next stop. Everybody stick with us. We'll be right back. The line. Cabot Creamery is proud to be celebrating 100 years making the world's finest dairy products. Cabot's award-winning cheddars and other dairy products stand apart because of their farmers' tireless dedication to quality and freshness, to healthy land and a sustainable future. A century after they started this journey, Cabot's farmer owners still know what matters most, family and community. The simple truth that we're stronger together than we are apart. That delicious products are the reward of a job well done. That when you love what you do this much, the best is always still to come. Join Heritage Radio Network on Monday, November 11th for a raucous feast to toast a decade of food radio. Our 10th anniversary Bacchanal is a rare gathering of your favorite chefs, mixologists, storytellers, thought leaders, and culinary masterminds. We'll salute the inductees of the newly minted HRN Hall of Fame, who embody our mission to further equity, sustainability, and deliciousness. Explore the beautiful Palm House and Yellow Magnolia Cafe, taste and imbibe to your heart's content, and bid on -on once-in-a-lifetime experiences and tasty gifts for any budget at our silent auction. Tickets available now at heritageradionetwork.org slash gala. Well, 
Welcome back to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman, and my guest today is Chef Whitney Otaka. Before the break, we were talking about her crazy commuting, going back and forth, and trying to gain as much knowledge and experience as she possibly could in Georgia, working at several restaurants. Your next stop on your culinary career was that you, uh, in 2010, you left Athens, right? Mm -hmm. And you left Athens to do something that I think tons of chefs dream about and many never get the opportunity to do that, which is you move to a small island off the coast of Georgia. Uh, it's called the Greyfield Inn and it is beautiful. If anyone is near a computer right now, I suggest you just Google it real quick. It's kind of, it looks magical. Tell us about it. What was that experience like? I know it is um, as isolated as it is beautiful. So there are probably some wonderful pros and some terrible cons. So take us through kind of the thought process of taking that position. And then when you showed up, was it as you expected? So, um, okay. So I, when I moved to Georgia, I went through this whole process of, um, exploring the state, exploring the region. And a great way I did this was through state parks. So any of the rare times off I had, I would go for these hikes or, you know, kind of find out about the region. And I, I'd learned about Cumberland Island, which is a national seashore, southernmost island off the Georgia coast. It borders with Florida, 17 miles long. Um, I'd learned about it on a PBS show. And I was kind of curious, what is this place? So I saved my money and I went and I spent a night there. And this was a couple years before I ever moved there. And it's sort of like it, the seed was planted basically, right? I, I, I was like, this is an amazing place because it's so isolated. So fast forward a few years and I'm at Eugene and Linton Hopkins is doing a dinner there. So I hear him talking about this place and I was like, you're doing a dinner there? Like what's, what's happening there? And so it, again, the seed started to grow and I was at this point where I'd kind of gone as far as I could go at five and 10, right? I was super fast, super proficient on the line. I could handle anything. I was working the craziest chefs. I was at Eugene. They wanted me to come on as a sous chef. Everybody wanted me to be a sous chef. And I felt like I'd kind of already been playing a sous chef role at five and 10. And I, as any great chef, have a bit of an ego <laughs> and was like, you know what? I want, I want to be the chef. Like I can do this. I, I know how to cook on the line. I know how to run a kitchen. I can do this. So I wrote the proprietors of Grayfield in a letter, just kind of just decided like, the, I'm going to go there. This place isn't known for food. You know, Linton Hopkins is interested in it. This is a place that can grow to be something in this region. I wrote them a letter and they were like interested. And I was like, okay. So they invited me down to cook and it is such an odd little place. It's a family run business. It's uh, an inn with 16 rooms. The house was built at the turn of the century. It's still in the Carnegie family. So it was built by um, Tom, Thomas and Lucy uh, Carnegie, right? Andrew, Andrew Carnegie's brother um, for their family. And it's, you know, it's a, a business that opened in the 60s, basically like kind of that bed and breakfast style, except for it's an isolated island. So all the meals are provided by the inn. It only had two cooks in the kitchen when I got there. I was the third person. It wasn't, it was, there was dead seasons. It was slow in the summer, slow in the winter. So they offer me the job. No one was actually even there to see my cooking. <laughs> <laughs> except for like the Porter Lee and the naturalist that night. But somehow I landed the job. I cooked for eight people, the guests. I was the only person in the kitchen that day, which was fine because I can get through anything, right? Eight, cooking for eight people versus 350 a night. I was like, oh, I got this. Um, and I was like, you know what? I'm taking this job. So I was um, dating my now husband, Ben Wheatley, who was also working at 5 and 10, you know, and I was like, just hold tight. I'll get you a job there. <laughs> so I go and I move to this island. They've never had four cooks in their kitchen. But now we have more than four cooks. But, you know, I had to convince them to hire my boyfriend, which I was like, I know this sounds crazy. You can fire him if you don't like him. He's a talented pastry chef. Let's yeah. bring him on board. I was like, you'll like him more than me. Um, like, I was like, 
I, I stake my reputation on it. We're not, we're very professional. It's, you know, we've always worked together. But uh, so here I am, I'm living on this like deserted island and I'm trying to figure out my style. You know, like that's the thing about the first time you take on a job as a chef is who are you? You are the person who's been creating these other menu items that other chefs have created, but who are you away from that? It takes some time to like establish that identity. And that's what I did there that first round was who am I as a chef? And when you're trying to figure this out and you've left the busiest restaurant in Athens and a very popular restaurant in Atlanta, both run by, uh, by well-known chefs and you're branching out on your own. And there's only a couple people coming to dinner, I guess, every single night. Was there any moments when you were on the line with one, two, uh, by yourself and you thought, have I made the right decision to come out here and isolate myself and kind of forge my own path or did it immediately feel right? I loved it. I loved being the boss. I loved being in charge. I loved writing the menus. I would, I mean, like when I started that job, there was no menu. I would stay up every night and plan what I was cooking the next day. I was learning the ingredients of the region. I was so into it. I just loved it. And just kind of geographically, how far away is it? How easy or hard is it to get deliveries there? Were you able to um, forage things from the island? Is it not really like that? How did that shape the menu development? Sure. The, the place that the, the in the, the place that it's in now, like as far as like access to produce and things like that have changed over the time that I've been there. When I first started, we didn't have a garden. We did, but it grew maybe a bus tub full of filet. sorry, when did you make the full-time transition to the island? Oh, so, sure. I started- 2011? So I was full-time there, but I left in between. Got it. So there's okay. a break in my career there, okay. or as far as like my time on the island. So to go back to the island itself, it, there's no bridges- um, to get there. You can't drive a car there, right? There's, you can either get there by boat or get there by plane. It's about a 45 minute boat ride from Fernandina beach, Florida. Um, another hub for it through the state park system is through St. Mary's, Georgia. So really hard to get there unless you are, you know, camping or staying at the inn. It's just not a place you get to. Deliveries come on a boat for me. So they come through our main offices, which means by the time it gets to me, I haven't had a chance to always check my products. So I really have to know my purveyors and I have to trust my purveyors because I might need it for dinner that night and I can't say, hey, this isn't what I want when it walks in the door. So the place it was, there was no garden. Now we have a, a, an acre and a half garden that grows specifically for the kitchen. Um, but then it was it was more fly by the seat of my pants. There was running around the island a little bit, but I mean, I was in that kitchen, you know, 14 hours a day trying to figure it out. I wasn't having some like fantasy, fantasy foraging life just yet. <laughs> I mean, with only three cooks and, you know, I mean, it's a place that the kitchen runs nonstop from 7am to 10pm, which isn't, there's crazier hours to be had for sure. But when you're the only source of food for your guests and your staff, you're going to be there all the time. So beyond the folks staying at the inn, did, did people, is it possible to make a day trip to the Cumberland Inn or do, do folks pop in for dinner on a boat and then leave. And I assume that now your cover counts are a lot higher, but when you started about how many folks would you have come in for dinner and now what does it look like? Sure. Yeah. So we, back then we would do dinner charters occasionally. Um, so people would come over from Amelia Island and do dinners, which we don't do anymore because we are really busy. And then also family members. So there are some isolated properties. 90% of it is a, is a a national seashore, right, a national park. But some of the families that originally had land there, the Carnegie's, the Rockefellers, the Candlers that own Coca-Cola, some of them still have um, houses. So sometimes when they're on the island, they'll come over to the house and, you know, request to book dinner. But again, th then is different from now because now it's like good luck getting it. Things have changed. <laughs> They've changed. I wonder if uh, – if the decision to go on Top Chef was, were you hoping that it would attract people to both the property and it would enhance your career? Did it just seem like a fun opportunity for you to grow? You obviously, you made it on the show. So what was that experience like? And was it 
instantaneous? Did you get home and did the phone start ringing off the hook once the promotion started running that you were on the show or did it take time to build up? So, okay, a couple of things. So when Hugh is actually the one who reached out to me and said, do you want to try to, you know, try out for Top Chef? And I sat with Ben and I was like, you know, this isn't necessarily my thing, right? It's not like I want to be on some competitive like cooking show on television, but Top Chef did, and maybe it still does. It does have like a stamp of approval. If you've been on it, there's a certain amount of recognition you get for that. And sometimes it's about exposure. You know, some people want to know who the person is cooking their food. So ultimately it was a decision to move forward with it because it would be good exposure. For the process of the show, I bleep and hated it. <laughs> I hated it. I hated it. I love the people. I'm not the type who's going to, like, create a lot of drama, freak out, get super drunk and wasted, barf on the ground, kick for, like, 15 hours, talk about how awesome it is. I'm kind of a controlled person in my environment. You know, I've, I've staged at La Bernadine, per se. These are restaurants I respect. I have a lot of respect for the history of my craft. And I didn't love that it was about being a personality, so I withdrew very quickly. I'm very quiet. If you watch my season, there's not a lot of film time with me because I wasn't interested in being crafted as a character. And I also really love sleep, and I really love eating. And those are two things you don't get a lot of when you're filming Top Chef. But I did have a lot of respect for the host. I loved Tom Colicchio critiquing my food. I was warned going on the show that I would cook the worst food of my career because of the environment. This is by another contestant who I knew had been on before me. And it's true. I mean, you're not in your kitchen. You're not in your... Imagine just going haywire. It's like we all joke that we have like PTSD when we walk into Whole Foods. You know, like we want to run around and grab everything. It's just this crazy thing. But I, I respected the chefs that were cre- critiquing what I was doing, and I cared about that. But it's like, I'm not going to cry over this. I mean, this is not, it didn't feel like a reality to me. So I got home and was like, oh, crap, I'm a, I've been on Top Chef, and I live on an island that no one can get to my cooking. So what do I do? And I was at this point where the inn wasn't evolving enough to where I wanted it to be. Like the garden wasn't there. There were thing, infrastructure that I needed more of. So I left be, as a result of having done Top Chef to go work and run a restaurant in Athens, Georgia that was offered to me. Um, so it did have a, so Top Chef did have an impact. Again, it gives you vi- visibility, recognition. People know who you are all of a sudden. It's like people think your food is instantly good who haven't had it because you've been on a television show, which is wild, which is why I need another television show. But, <laughs> but I mean, it's, you know, like it's a great opportunity and I respect what it is and what it, it does for people's careers. So. So you make the move back to Athens. Mm -hmm. How does that feel to leave the inn and go back to the mainland? Obviously, you've since jumped back to the island. So how did that process unfold? And what was your... Uh, what were your hopes when you left the inn and moved back to Athens? I think I was excited to get back into like a full service kitchen, you know, with a bigger team, Um, again, a, a different, totally different setup. And so I went back to Athens and I was excited. I was presented a restaurant that was already in existence. It was called Farm 255 at the time. It was great. It had, you know, a lot of values that I appreciated and, it was it was uh, it was wonderful, and the restaurant was kind of a mess interior. Like uh, it was one of those things where you go in. It's a project you go in and clean up, which is something I will never do again. But it was one of those projects where it needed a lot. You know, it just didn't have it didn't have <laughs> the infrastructure. So it felt good to be back, but it was a place where I kind of was wondering if it was a place I needed to be, which maybe I'm jumping ahead here. It it closes. um, It closes the owner sell it um, about um, two years, I guess a year and a half into me running it. They offered to sell it to me. I think they brought me in because they wanted me to buy it. But I saw that it was a bit of a financial mess and I said, no, thank you, but I'll see it out. So it closes, which... 
leads me to another restaurant, which maybe you're going to ask me about. Do Let's talk that? about that next. <laughs> yeah. So then, then what happens after that? So then Hugh calls me and says, Hey, I'm moving five and 10 to a new building. Mm-hmm. What do you want? You want to open a restaurant together? And I've always wanted, he says, I've always wanted to open a Mexican restaurant. And if you go back to my youth, um, we didn't touch on this too much, but Mexican cuisine has sort of been, it was one of the cuisines that I was first introduced to is from scratch cooking. It's something I have a deep love for and a lot of respect for. And to be presented with an opportunity to go in depth with another cuisine like that, I was like, hell yeah. Except for I was in Athens, Georgia, <laughs> and, you know, if you're going to go in depth with the cuisine, Mexican might be, you know, pretty, pretty forward thinking for a small southern town. But I was excited. I was into it. We got together and we put it in the old five and ten space. It was called Cinco Ideas. And it was probably one of it's one of my favorite projects I've ever worked on. And it was also short lived. <laughs> And why was that short-lived? So it was a devastating moment in my career, actually. I, um, we opened that restaurant in February of 2014, 13, and it closed by October of that year. It was very popular in the beginning. The owners saw the popularity, increased the prices within the first month. They wanted one thing, then they wanted another thing. Um, Hugh was not as involved as he said he was going to be. Um, it was more of the other owner who I didn't know had a little more control. They kept changing the format. Summer in Athens is slow. It was a slow time. You know, we were serving mole. It was something new. People still wanted kind of like what they thought was Tex-Mex, right? There's still a lot of confusion about what the identity of Mexican cuisine is, right? And we had studied in Oaxaca and we were into Tlayudas and house-made masa before it was like totally launching. You know, like Macienda had just sort of like begun to sell their corn. I was one of the first people to buy it. And they wanted more. They wanted me to cheapen the product. They wanted me to buy the cheapest thing I could find instead of working with farmers. And I said no. And I think that they realized that I wasn't going to be controlled by what their interests were. So the day the restaurant closed, I found out the day they closed the doors. And this is someone who had been my mentor and I'd worked for, for, I mean, I'd worked really hard for, for three and a half years, both Ben and I, Ben was the chef de cuisine there. Um, And he pulled the rug out from under us, gave us a quick phone call and said no more. That's the last time I spoke to him. Yeah, you've articulated a really complex part of the business, which is uh, the chef-owner relationship and how although you can be the chef and you can walk in and everyone looks to you as being in charge, and you are, you don't necessarily have all the tools at your disposal to fix every single problem. And unfortunately, sometimes you don't hear about things that are going on behind the scenes Mm -hmm. if you're not a owner partner. Um, From that kind of traumatic incident where you are are kind of burned on two fronts, like personally and professionally from what you're saying is what it sounds like. When you reflect back on that, what is like the big takeaway for you as you look forward? Because you have a ton of career left in front of you. Do you look back on that and are there pieces that you can now take away from that that does anything feel positive about that? Can you spin it positively? Oh, sure. I mean, the team we built there was one of the most beautiful teams that I have ever worked with. And so the first thing we did was go into damage control. And instead of worrying about ourselves, which was Ben, the chef de cuisine, myself, and then Christopher Becerra, who was our general manager, we made sure everybody else was placed in another job. Like we cared so much about them. And those, those core members that worked for us at Cinco still come and work for us. Alejandro Tamez, who was one of our executive sous, he's running the inn right now when I'm not there. I mean, we built a team. It's one of the things that's most important to me about a restaurant is the family unity of that restaurant and taking care of the people that work for you. And I learned that I'm a different manager and a different style of chef than Hugh Atchison, the chef I worked for, because I 
cared enough to look out for the people that worked for me. And it's something that is just so important to me. But I, I think I just learned that, you know, even through those moments of travesty of where you just think, oh, my, my fucking world just fell apart. You know, it's just like there's so much to grow out of that. I mean, where I am now, I wouldn't be if that hadn't happened. So, it's, I mean, it's always moving forward. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. It just happens. It can definitely feel like the end of the world <laughs> when it happens. I, I want to change gears a little bit and talk about the cookbook. Uh, the cookbook is called The Saltwater Table, and it's all about your exploration of southern coastal cuisine. First, I want to know a little bit about the process of how you got the cookbook and and people love to hear about kind of like the nitty gritty of the book proposal and who approached you or did you send it out? But before we talk about that, I'm curious, you were born in California. You have lived in the South for quite a long time, but you weren't born there. Uh, Did anyone from the South upon hearing that you're writing the cookbook or when it came out, was there any pushback against you of people saying you aren't from Georgia? I'm Southern by marriage. (laughs) (laughs) No, there's never been pushback. I mean, I think one of the great things about the Southern food community is how supportive everyone is of each other. I've never felt that because I wasn't from the South, that it wasn't acceptable for me to explore my voice within that region. And it is such a strong, strong food identity in our country. And there's so many different parts of it. I mean, I just absolutely love cooking in that environment. And again, my husband, who I've been with now for 12 years, grew up in a small town in um, in Washington, Georgia, and he was a big part of my culinary education. I often say it's not necessarily what we learn in a professional kitchen, but it's what we learn in homes, in home cooking. So, you know, I, I got to see, you know, his grandmother cooking on the farm, and I learned from his family traditions as well that they opened to me. Um, so that that was, you know, it's it's something I just undertook with a great amount of seriousness. I would never write on a subject that I didn't feel comfortable in at all. I've had people from Mississippi allot my collard greens and give me a badge of honor, you know. I wouldn't say my cornbread is perfect, but I can make a pretty good biscuit. So, you know, there, there's there's things that I do well and still things I need to learn because it's a huge food community. You know, and so so when I when I began, I went back to the island after Cinco. So I went back, the garden's flourishing. All of a sudden, a new garden team has taken over. This place is the place I wanted to build. What it is now is what I wanted to create back when I was younger and didn't know what I was doing. So through the process of working there again, I fell in love with it even deeper. And I, I really... I really think it's a really unique region in the South, right? So if you see, you think of Southern food, you, you tend to think of certain foods. But being in our location, we're a semi-tropical um, climate zone, which is unique for the state of Georgia, right? We're almost more Floridian. We have sort of this like swamp-like <laughs> atmosphere, heavy humidity in the summertime. Nothing grows in the month of August because it is so hot. So here I am in this really unique region of the South, and I see it as a place that isn't always vocalized within Southern cooking. And oftentimes Florida is left out of the dialogue of what Southern cuisine is. But I see it as a really unique region because here we're drawing from Caribbean influence, so many interesting cultures that move into this region um, that also intermingle with low country cuisine, which is really famous in Charleston. So I, I'm there. I knew I always wanted to write a book. People, a lot of the the family members were like, you should write a cookbook. And I was like, no, no, I'm not going to write a cookbook. And then I just saw it. I just saw it. One day I was sitting on the Lucy Ferguson, which is our boat. It's going from Florida over to the island, which is Georgia. And I'm like, I see it. I see the book. I see the chapters of the book. Ben's like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, it's based on the ecology of the region. It's oyster season. It's vegetable season. It's shrimp season. He's like, what kind of chapters are those? I'm like, no, I see the book. I see the book. So I'm like, I sit down. I literally write out the chapter titles, which we have now as our chapter titles. And I'm like, I'm going to write a book. So I'm like, okay, what do I do? (laughs) So we, the inn was working with, um, at the time, Polished Pig uh, Media, and now it's called Sprout House, Mel- Melanie Robinson. Uh, she's the owner of that company. So I reached out to her first and said, I have an idea for a book. And she's like, very kindly was like, 
let me see if anybody's like taking anybody on. You need an agent, which is a nice way of saying like, let me see if anybody actually wants to work with you. <laughs> and so she found a literary agent, um, Sarah Smith, who is with David Black and Associates, who loved it. She loved the idea. And clearly I like to talk so I can talk my way through my proposal. So we get on the phone and I tell her all about, you know, my idea So she really held my hand through the process of writing a proposal. And she claims I'm an overachiever because I had my proposal. Like, I invested a lot in my proposal. I would write every minute that I wasn't in the kitchen, which I was still running a kitchen as a chef when I wrote my proposal. The proposal with photos was about 100 pages. I had it. You wrote the whole cookbook. (laughs) I had it, like illustrated. I had like a great team. The photographer, Emily Dorio, that worked on the project with me, she came and did some photographs. You know, I just really wanted people to understand this place visually because it's so beautiful and so impressive. So I just, it took about mm, two and a half months for me to write the proposal. And then uh, we sent it out and I came to New York. I met with different publishers I razzle-dazzled them with my conversation. <laughs> and it just came out. And it just it came out today. It came out today. It's birthday. Oh, I thought it's it today. came out yesterday. No, it's today. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. What's the full title of the cookbook for everyone who's gonna about to look for it online? The Saltwater Table, Recipes from the Coastal South. And I'm going to get you out of here on this last question. We have heard all today about all these different stops along the way. You're at a great spot right now. Seems like you're very content and it seems like you and your team and your husband, you've built something very special out there. Any thoughts about your own individual project? Because while you are the chef and you are the driver and the decision maker and the face of the Cumberland Inn, uh, it is not your own individual project. If you could, five, 10 years from now, dream of your own project, what would it be and where would you open it? Sure. Um, it's easy. It's something that I'm already dreaming up. You know, I think the inn has really inspired me in a lot of ways. It's remote uh, location and I'm a traveler now. I travel constantly when I'm not working. So I'd love to have something that sort of is almost a small inn with a very strong culinary focus, uh, cooking classes, beautiful restaurant. Um, these are things that are actually in motion for me. I'm trying to sort of work towards now. Um, as far as the location, that is sort of up in the air. I would go anywhere in the world. I mean, I love cooking and food so much that all I want to do is keep learning and um, uh, expressing food in different regions. So, so we'll see where that lands. But that is the that is the goal right now is to kind of move into our own place where we can interact with guests more. When people come, it's for food and for education and creating a really unique place and voice for that. Well, hopefully, we'll check back in with you in a couple years, and we'll be talking about maybe your own in somewhere, anywhere around the world. If you want to find more about Whitney and her cookbook, you can obviously look up the title of it online. It came out today. And if you are in Georgia and you're lucky enough to snag a reservation, let's tell people how they can find the restaurant and how they can try to get on the boat and get over there for a reservation. What's the website for the restaurant? So it's uh, grayfieldin.com. And you do have to stay at the inn uh, to stay there or fly in on your private plane. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just grayfieldin.com. Uh, I also have a website, which is whitneyotaka.com. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to me as well. So go see Whitney at the Grayfield Inn on Cumberland Island. Thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations on the debut of your first cookbook. I hope it's a big release today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. You can join us here for new episodes of The Line every Tuesday at 11 a.m. on Heritage Radio. The Line is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritageradionetwork. 
Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners just like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.